there's a lot of ha things happening in our communities right now that do not support democracy, do not support you know justice for all. And I think this fight for trans rights, for you know gender expression, is really about freedom. Your freedom to live your life. I should be able to choose how I dress and how I look and walk out of my home. Uh, the fear here is, as I said, we're going back to this kind of us and them kind of thing. And I don't think, I know, I know that's not healthy. And through these algorithms, they're getting more and more and more of these same images. That's all you're going to get is further messages pushing you either further to the right, further to the left. And that's certainly not good for American democracy. This legislation in many ways is unprecedented. They are taking away certain things that many individuals already had access to. So they're turning back the clock on a lot of things. And if they can turn back the clock on this group of folks, I feel like they can turn back the clock on many other groups of folks. And as a black woman, I'm terrified. We're really talking about freedoms and what kind of freedoms are we going to give up or are we gonna fight for? My name is Shane Winmeyer and my drag persona is Buffet. Uh, Buffet is a ode to the long lost Tammy Faye, who was a Southern pioneer for queer people, uh, helped stand up for HIV and AIDS. Uh, my husband and I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. We've been here for over 26 years and I do drag as a way to raise money for different charities here locally uh, in the Queen City and across the Carolinas. So when I think of drag, I really feel that drag is a way to not only be creative and express yourself, but a way to give back, a way to inspire, give hope. It has a way of educating, uh, kind of tearing down those, those binaries of gender and allow people to kind of express themselves. I have been really impressed over the years of how much money I have been able to raise, you know, as a drag queen. Last year, we raised uh, roughly over $15,000 and gave it back to three charities. Drag queen history really dates back, I mean, you know, native indigenous tribes, um, you know, and, and having people who were seen as gender queer. If you look back in the late 1800s, early 1900s with the pansy craze, you know, drag was, was popular. People loved to dress up and express themselves. And it wasn't until really the 1930s, 1940s where drag went underground. Uh, it's been something that has inspired and given hope during the AIDS and HIV crisis, raising money for those who didn't have money for medical treatment uh, and really just just allowing our community to have a way to, to come together and to support one another. And so it's not a surprise that, you know, history repeats itself when it comes to anti-drag sentiment, when it comes to, you know, hateful rhetoric and, and hateful actions toward trans or non-binary people. Yeah, I would say that freedom of expression is the ability to wear whatever you want. You know, I, it, this, this drag thing, I, I just don't get. I mean, I just don't get. We finally have achieved a victory where we can recognize and honor the humanity of someone who may have sexual preferences that are di different from the majority of the population. What I did not anticipate was sort of the backlash that you're getting now. And so you may not go after LBGTQ people generally because that's a sizable portion of the American population. So then you become more precision-like. You go after drag, drag shows or drag queens. The media has in many ways exacerbated this whole debate around drag queens and story hour. It's uh, misleading, it's stereotypical. Um, you know, Drag Queen Story Hour is really just someone, you know, dressed in costume, reading stories to children. There's nothing more to it than that. A drag brunch is very different from a Drag Queen Story Hour, which is very different, you know, a drag brunch from a late night club. Like, you should consider when you go to Drag Queen Story Hour, you know, a five-year-old, you know, is going to see a princess. They're, they're not going to see anything more than that. Or they're going to see someone dressed up as a dragon, and it's going to be a dragon. It's the political statement you're making. We need to eradicate this because this may have an effect on children. Children may see this and they may decide they want to change genders and whatever it is. 
But this is all done that's politically motivated. And I think the disappointment here is what seemed to be the one area that there was decided progress. Even that progress now seems to be in, in question. Wave of legislation. It's the uh, medical bans, it's the drag queen bans. They're denying access to healthcare in a targeted fashion, which definitely restricts human rights. Bills that make it so that you can't change your gender marker on your birth certificate and other documentation that's really important for travel. Like when you're going through the airport and your ID doesn't match who you are, like how are you supposed to travel? Human rights are rights that every human being has by the mere fact of that person's existence. These rights, the specification of these rights are in a number of international treaties. In international human rights law, you have economic and social and cultural rights on a par with civil and political rights. And for some reason, that concept has not made a dent in terms of the American psyche. That's why we have homelessness. That's why we have enormous inequalities in terms of educational opportunities, enormous disparities in terms of income and wealth. I would say the biggest example would be health. I mean, health care. It's overcomplicated, and it shouldn't be. We all have human rights. The question is whether we protect human rights or not. The laws that are being proposed or, or in some states actually being passed that are anti-drag, anti-trans, anti-queer you know, uh, are, are not only harmful for the actions that they take, but the, the climate that they create. And even if a law doesn't pass, the, the hateful rhetoric, the, the actions that some people will take to to, to bully or harass a young trans kid, like that's that can't be measured. Um, I take personally when people are assaulted or harassed for being who they are. And so it makes me angry. It makes me um, even more passionate to try to be louder and to speak up because I do have privilege as a drag entertainer who you know lives their life primarily as a cis uh, gay man. If that means that I have to put on a dress in order to advocate and educate and create that visibility that is so important right now, then that's exactly what I'll do. I think most people would agree with the proposition that dehumanization is something we ought never to engage in. What I think people are less apt to pick up on is how that is done, the insidious ways that that is done. That's again a time-honored practice. So scape Goading is, I would say, is the same as dehumanization. Pick somebody, pick some unpopular target, blacks, Jews, Muslims, whatever it is, and they then become the cause of, uh, of all your societal ills. Holocaust was certainly all about that. There was anti-Semitism, but it was the government campaign that changed things. When the government targeted, purposely targeted, same thing in Rwanda. I just point out that the radio station which per, uh, perpetrated it, to my mind, what's, what's so surprising is the ability of political leaders to foment this kind of, of anger that, and the people then lash out. They can gain political points by othering other people. This is exactly what world leaders all over the globe have done. All the gestures towards human rights and common humanity and the universalism of human rights, uh, that oftentimes gets dispensed immediately. And just pick your target. Which target are we going to go after now? I do feel that the fight for trans justice, for, for gender and sexuality, uh, is a watershed moment in our history. I think that now we live in a world where lawmakers are using trans kids and you know non-binary people as pawns, as, as political games in order to get out votes. And so, you know, part of my goal, and I think a lot of the efforts that are being created is to educate and to tell people that, you know, trans people, you know, non-binary people are just like all of us. Uh, they just have a different, you know, gender identity, a different way to express their gender. I mean, marginalization is, is thorough and it's complete. If you look at homeless populations, a large percentage, particularly among teenagers, are trans teenagers who've been either thrown out of their households or decide to leave on their own accord. 
And so you get it from all ends. You get it politically, economically, and socially. As someone who identifies with the Native Indigenous community, I'm part of the Iowa tribe. You know, personally, I'm an advocate and try to bring attention to the, the two-spirit people out there, uh, you know, like myself, who, you know, are oftentimes forgotten or their stories are not celebrated or honored, you know, within our, you know, conversations around intersection of, of racial justice and, and queer issues. The greater risk for young people of color that are uh, non-binary, trans, is that they experience unemployment at four times the rate of other individuals, like the general population. They experience violence at a higher rate. In order for any of us to ensure that we all have equal rights, we have to fight for the least of us, and that is Black, transgender women. They are being hit hardest by these bills, by the current culture. They are being murdered. They are having their um, health care taken away. And our health care system has already been detrimental to Black women. We have the worst outcomes in health care. And Black transgender women at this point are at the very bottom. I am with the Campaign for Southern Equality. I am the Engagement and Resource Manager. In the course of our work, we saw that there was actually a need for this continuum of care model, working on the tangible aspect of making sure that folks weren't losing access to the current medication, their current supply of hormones, and everything that they're currently on, because when you suddenly stop hormone medication, you can have really dire consequences. If we can support and lift up those that are uh, marginalized the most, rising tides lift all boats, then we can help all of us. Campus Pride Strong! Love it. Campus Pride came through my own, you know, passion to help others. An organization that maybe could help support some young person like myself coming out you know, on campus. And we've been around for 20 plus years now. Uh, the organization works with about 1,400 different college campuses. And our mission is really building leadership and creating more safe, inclusive campus communities for LGBTQ plus people. With the recent attacks on trans and non-binary young people in states like Florida and Texas, we've just been amplifying efforts. It's been a real challenging time. You know, I, I say this all the time, it, it's just as important as it was 20 years ago, if not more important now. What I would like to say to young people who are at risk or afraid due to the things that are happening, there are many more people on your side and who are here to support you than those that are against you. Way, way more, hands down. I think in all other societies, you have to fight for your human rights. And, uh, and it's, this country is no different. And what we're seeing in some respects is a backsliding here. Again, you could either despair because of the backsliding or say there's not going to be backsliding. Not on my watch, not in my country. We really all need to you know, be loud to stand up and to say, no, this, this isn't America. This isn't what you know, we believe uh, as democracy. We all have the freedom to be who we are. You know, everyone uh, is worthy of human dignity, of, you know, of living their life fully and authentically. And I think that's a message that that is lost and I, I try to share that through uh, my drag brunches and my drag shows. Um, you know, so that way someone out there is listening and hopefully learning something that will help some young trans kid when they tell their, their mom, their dad, their family that they're trans and that they, they need their support. And um, you know, that's ultimately the power of, of drag and how it can help change the world for the better.